Good morning. So for today's talk, I had a title for it, but we didn't get it up there yet. It was uh, Dinner for Two, Please. Um, I was thinking a little bit about communion as a meal. And a lot of times we think of it as a shared meal among believers, among the body, a unifying meal. But also I thought about it being an intimate meal. How this meal is not just a meal of community, but an intimate meal of two. I was reading a little bit in my Bible as we were studying John, and I've been flipping back and forth between John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and that's what kind of got me a little bit on this idea. And I was picturing a, a date, kind of like early in the relationship. You think about, you know, especially if you're like working, got your first job, have a little extra money in your pocket. You think about taking someone else on a nice date. So you start by planning and thinking, okay, well, when are we going to do this? You have to know a time. Then you have to know a place. So you start doing that and you make your preparations. And then you keep thinking about it. What should I wear? What are we going to talk about? What's going to be said? And both parties of the date do this. You tell them, get ready for a date. Where are we going? It's a surprise. <laughs> no, I have to know. What do I wear? <laughs> you're trying to think of what to wear. You're preparing. You're thinking. You have it on your mind. What is this date going to be like? It's just preparedness to go and to dine together. <laughs> In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, it is said, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And thinking about this meal, it was making me think about the dual nature of this meal. The meal of kind of coming together, becoming one body and one church. They also talked about this fellowship with the Father and the Son. And that's that other intimate relationship with this meal to be focused on. That's not saying we don't notice the other people in our restaurant when we're having our meal. We need to maintain a constant awareness of God's presence in our life, in our area, in our body of believers. But we also need to be bringing in our ongoing fellowship to remind ourselves of and celebrate our fellowship and relationship with God. That needs to also be a focus. Continuing in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It continues to kind of shape this, this thought process. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, eight persons, were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this. He's preparing a place for us. He died for us. He suffered once for the righteousness of the unrighteous. That's us. In doing this, he was putting to death sinful flesh to be made again alive in us. But why? 
And he goes back to talk about in the time of Noah. We go back to many times in the Old Testament, the sacrifice to make us clean, to make us closer and being able to be in the presence of God, that closer, intimate relationship. That was the goal. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 53, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, and yes, you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. Whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. We talk a lot about this, this verse, especially when we think about the, the reason that we come together. And in a way, we have three major reasons we come together for the communion when we're thinking and meditating on the word. It tells us to look to the past, to meditate and remember Christ's death. But here it also gives us a look to the future in anticipation of his coming again. But we also talk about Christ living in me. And that's the present. This is that meal for two. When you come up and when you partake, we are doing that as a community, but we're doing that as an individual. But you are never an individual. That is a meal for two. With the Holy Spirit living in you, we need to be aware of his presence in our lives now when we partake. That got me a lot, of, a lot of reflecting when I was thinking about this, about maintaining this continual awareness of God's presence in our life. Now, yes, we need to be thinking about our community and our fellowship and our body. We're told that in 1 Corinthians. We're told how that sh should be a gathering among people how no one should be left out. The focus should be on the meal. But I say while partaking of that meal, we need to start treating it like that intimate, romantic date. Now that doesn't mean every meal that we have is just a one-on-one -on -one meal. But when we take the time while we partake, while we reflect before we partake, what if you prep for it like a date? Especially back in that honeymoon phase when everything was exciting and that love was fresh and new. Read about what you're going to say, how you're going to look, where you're going to go. Do we do that each Sunday before we come and partake? We're told the place. We know where we need to go. When we gather as community believers on the first day of the week, we partake. We know the meal, the blood and wine, Christ's body and blood. We know where our mind should be how we should come, how we should focus. But do we think about it beforehand and prepare? Do you get nervous wondering, oh no, it's coming up. Am I ready? Am I ready to expose myself, reflect, think on my personal sins, have faith in the belief that if I turn away from those sins, with God's help, I will be forgiven. I will be made righteous, although I'm, un although I'm an unrighteous person. We need to be thinking and praying about our ongoing fellowship. 
remind ourselves and celebrate that fellowship and that relationship with God. That shouldn't just be a honeymoon phase either. If we only cared about our loved ones and had that romantic date in the honeymoon phase, that's not great. If you're doing that, caution. (laughs) Take some time out. You need to renew that relationship. You need to take some special time to prepare. Many of you know I'm a counselor, and I do a lot of couples counseling. And sometimes it's actual couples coming in asking for help, and sometimes it's one spouse or the other saying, what do I do? And there's one story here all the time, and it has to do with, you know, I remember when they used to be so excited, and they would take me out, and we would go on all these dates. They were so spontaneous. You hear that word. They were so alive. They were so excited. But now things just seem kind of, uh. And I hear the excuse as well, you know, we still go out on a date night every night. We still try to make time for each other. We go dinner with just the two of us. So then we kind of ask and dig in, well, what's making this different? Why doesn't it feel the same? It's like, well, it's so planned. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not getting excited about it. It's not this new and fresh idea or thing. It just seems like I have to. We don't want that in our relationship with God. We come here every week to partake. Because we're commanded to. We're told to. We have to. If we believe. But we need to keep that spark alive. And hint out there, you all can still do that in your personal relationships too. Pick out an event. Look forward to it. Meditate on it. Be ready for it in your heart and be excited for it. Think about where is my mind going to be during this conversation, during this learning, during this teaching, during the partaking. When I come in to take of this meal, what do I need to say to God? Not only what's being preached today, not only what we're going to learn, what we're going to digest But what do I have to come and atone for? Where do I need help? Where do I need to grow? And how do I become intimate with Christ and God through this sacrifice, through this communion? So a few things that I try to remember in looking forward with excitement to this meal. We like sevens, so let's go there. (laughs) Seven things. One, Jesus died for me personally. He shed his blood for me personally. He's personally forgiven me before I even sinned. Through him, I've been made a child of God. His spirit has been sent to dwell in me personally. All the time, he is with me. Jesus' body was broken and tortured for me personally. But his healing and restoring power is also available to me personally. When I come to this meal, that is what I think about. That's what we all need to think about to make this an intimate moment. Christ died for me. He is inviting me to this personal, ongoing fellowship. So let us think how we can keep that excitement, that relationship, intimate, personal, and alive with Christ and our God as we begin to pray. Let us pray for the body. Our Father in heaven, we come before you to praise you, to thank you, for your grace. 
that through your son, you have given righteousness to us, the unrighteous. His body broken for us to bring us into a relationship with you. To help us through your Holy Spirit to use this gift worthily in us. Help us to confess and to forsake our sins and to believe that we are forgiven through Christ and that we continue to grow in a faith and a love day by day until we get to come to you in the joys of eternal salvation through this sacrifice of your son Jesus. Amen. Let us again come to you in prayer for the blood. Our Father, we come again to praise you for the sacrifice of your Son, whose blood cleanses us. As we come to partake, help us to love you with all of our heart, to truly believe in you, and live in accordance to your will. In your son's name we pray. Amen.